you are live facebook hey. live how you guys doing hey, we guys. have another oh. episode <laughs> cheers we have cheers. another episode of beer 30, 30. with the nashville villain nashville i was about to say nashville <laughs> 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 hope you guys are doing good we have a great uh, beer buddy today mm -hmm. uh we have um a guy named rick Murata. he's a drummer he's a percussionist he's played with with everybody. everybody. Let me just run it down. With Aretha Franklin, Carly Simon, Steely Dan, James Taylor, Paul Simon, John Lennon, Hall and Oates, Stevie Nicks, Winona, uh, Roy Orbison, Todd Rundgren, Roberta Flack, Peter Frampton, the list go. Qu Quincy Jones. I can't not say and, him. And on the yeah. records. On the right, records right, right, right. Know. Randy on Newman, Peter he's Gabriel. I want to ask him guy. about Peter yeah. Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. As well as being compo <clears throat> composer for shows like Everybody Loves Raymond, Yes, Dear, Center of the Universe. Wow. I mean, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Great you know, career. You know, he keeps on. He's going to have a future in his business. <laughs> yeah, man. After COVID, dude, he's, he's going to be rocking. <laughs> uh, we're going to bring Rick in. Hang on a second. So we're going to do this. Hey, Ricky. Ricky. Hey, guys. Hey. It's been a long time. It's like I haven't seen you in minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. it's like I haven't seen you in minutes. How you doing? Good. Pretty good. Good. You look good. I'm suffering well, through this whole thing just like everybody else. I, I get – I'm very sensitive to this COVID uh, stuff. I mean, yeah. I'm here in L.A. right now. I'm going to be heading down to Florida soon, but, you know, it's pretty – Pretty much everybody's been on lockdown around here. I'm afraid of culture shock. I've been talking to some friends of mine down in Miami, and they just said it's like it never even happened down there. Oh, is yeah. that right? It's wide open. Well, we're social distancing right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at you guys thinking, thank God I'm not in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, I'm an old timer. So I've I've been really lucky, knock wood. I've uh, I've gotten uh two of the vaccines I've gotten the shot and finished the whole protocol and I'm feeling good and just trying to not have anxiety. Well, that's there. awesome. Did you yeah. have any reactions at all to the, to the shots? We're actually trying to figure that out because I did not really, but um, you know, I just talked to a buddy of mine in, in Miami, who's a doctor, very, very close friend of mine. He just called me a little while ago. He just came from his doctor because He's just like, he says, Rick, I'm 80%. And, you know, I'm all for the vaccine, but there are so many things that people don't have any idea what's going on. People that were sick or still sick, people that didn't have feel anything. And then from the shot, which is really a good thing to, to have, I, my, I'm a believer in it. There's just people go like, well, he, he's like a, he's about three weeks ahead of me and he's tired. Really? You know, really? Yeah. Tired. Now there's so, like three different shots, right? Or there's like a Johnson and Johnson new thing that just came out, right? That just came out like today. Yeah, okay. did you have the Pfizer one? I had the Pfizer one, yeah. And then um, you know, my assistant Christina Brett knows her. Mm -hmm. Uh she so um when I got when she got me, she booked me to get the shot out here in Los Angeles. And then uh she said, There's a couple, there's some spots open. I said, um, I, I don't know if Brett remembers my friend Sam McMurray, the actor. Sam's a uh, really close friend of mine. I said, maybe you could book Sam. So she got Sam the shot. Then mm -hmm. Sam calls her and says, listen, my friend who he had done a TV show with, this woman, Terry, could you help her? She can't figure out. The long, the bottom, the long story short is she ended up getting 15 people. Oh, wow. 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 Look at her. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, they were, they were, they, they, she was crying one day. I went down, what's going on? She says, I got this woman who she didn't even know. Um, but through this whole the sequence of events, she got, and she was crying. And then I got her husband got shot and he was crying. Because, you know, it's serious when you get to be a certain age, there were a lot of people dropping. But we don't have to talk about that stuff because I think, doesn't everybody know about COVID right by now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know, yeah, I don't, yeah, but I didn't. I don't get to talk to people that's actually had the shot. And I thought, I, th I think yeah. the listeners would like to know if you if you had a reaction. Is it, is it because they're not uh, as many people down there getting it, or is it because you guys are so young you don't know anybody old enough to be getting? I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, I definitely know people that are, that yeah. should get it and that are getting it. My, my wife it, is administering the shot. 
Is that oh, her? awesome. Congratulations to her. I got to tell you one thing before we move on from this. Yeah. The day I went in to get the shot, you know, here it was in L.A., and I got it out at um, at uh, in Northridge at CSUN, Brett. If you remember, I think that's what it was, CSUN. And and yeah. and it was – like to know. Thanks for sharing. It was – so smooth and so easy, but I have never seen people happier doing their jobs in my life. Oh, uh, that's great. It was, um, it was, I, you know, I, it gets to me because they came, they, we did it there. It was, you're in your car, you pull up and it was so organized. They had like 15 lanes. And when you went there, you had an appointment and it took all, you know, you're in and out of there. To get the shot, it took less than 15 minutes, and then you wait 15 minutes, so it was really easy. Yeah. yeah. I have other friends that waited in line for four hours and were still thrilled to get it. But when you get there, and there's like three or four people there, there's a couple of people bringing these things out of freezers and this and that, and that, you know, the movie. There wasn't one person that looked like they hated their job. Hmm. Ah, that's great. Interesting. And you know, one guy uh, when I got the second shot, um, they 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 congratulate you. And this this guy who gave me the second shot, I said, "Do you mind if I take a picture?" He goes, "No, of course not. This is your day. This is your moment. This is." <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're, they they and they're you know they're, they're no matter how you feel about it, if you're in if you're in your wife's shoes. You have to go home every day knowing that you saved somebody's life. I don't care how you feel about this this illness. People are dying from it, and yeah. people are getting people are getting vaccinated that would have died. So if she vaccinated 150 people one day, you know, let's say, let's just there have to be 10 of those people or five of those people would have ended up in the hospital, and one or two of them might have been dead. Yeah. 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 Every day she's saving somebody's life. So tell her thank you from all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Rick, we, we'd love to hear, like, you know, um, just to tell everyone, like, how you started in the, in your career and, you know, as a drummer, as a composer. Yeah, where, where are you uh, from originally? That's from New York. Originally from New York. Okay. Well, so, what, let me ask you, what did your parents think about your drumming? Did they say, like, what? You want me to get you a drum set? And the fact you and your brother are drummers. And well-known yeah. drummers, both of you. Yeah, and I have another brother who could play drums, sing, and plays bass. Um, oh, cool. So, so that's like, that's like four questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I I grew up in New York, and then when I was young, my parents, when I was in like first or second grade, my parents moved to Cleveland for a few years, where my brother Jerry was born, and then we moved back to New York. And I grew up in New York, and um, the, the the way I got started is. Pretty much anybody who knows me knows this. I had no idea what I was going to do, but my parents were dancers. Hmm. So they left. My father started selling cards. He left the dance business. And and my mother said to me once, I said, why did uh, you and dad leave the business? She said, your father didn't want you guys growing up in show business. Hmm. That didn't work out too well. <laughs> but then later, later I asked my father why, and he said, "Ah, he looked. You know, I didn't want to be your mother's dance partner. So it was who knew. <laughs> but, but uh, so I was, I was already in college. Uh, actually, from New York, I went down to Alabama, to Athens, Alabama, for one year for school, and then when I came back, my all hell broke loose at home, and I wanted to go back there, but my dad was not thrilled with the idea of me." not working, not going to class, and I don't blame him because I was really young. So I started around New York, and I picked up drumsticks when I was 19. That's the point I was getting okay. to. Wow. So I didn't know what I was going to do. And I started – but because I used to do go to dances and dance a lot, and they'd have these contests, and some guys said to me – I remember David Spinoza, who was a great guitar player, said to me one time, you know, man, we were really good friends back then. He was an incredible guitar player. And he said uh, – if you play drums, I'd hire you. You'd be in my band. And a buddy of mine got drafted, Billy Reed, who was playing drums in that band. I said to Billy, and I didn't know anything about drums. I said, Billy, you know, what are you going to do with your drums when you're gone? And he went, I don't know. Storage? I said, I'll hold on to them for you. He went, okay, great. 
So two months later, I had that. I was playing in that band. So wait, are you self-taught? I mean, yeah. yeah. Oh my you God! How did, how did you learn? How did you just playing? Sounds with like records you learned on stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? So I don't know if you guys are familiar with David Spinoza, but he's. I grew up in an area where these guys were. I grew up in an area with really great musicians. And Dave was one of the best, and he he, for example. He was doing studio work in New York City, and he had his own band, which I played in, and he also wrote. He's an unbelievable guitar player. When, Paul, when the Beatles split up, Paul McCartney did that solo album, and then he went out and he said, McCartney went out and he, and he went, um, he, he auditioned, I think, every guitar player in England, Europe, and the United States, and the guitar player he hired for the Ram album, his first solo album, was... Dave Spinoza. Hmm. And David played on the Ram album until he had a little run-in, I think, with uh, somebody. And and then Paul hired Hugh McCracken. Hugh and David are my two best friends. Yeah. Hugh he passed away, but they, they were my two best friends, and they played on that record together, and we, we just worked together after that. But I learned to play from those guys I grew up with, like Andy Newmark. Was a, I used to watch him play when I was a kid. And Dave, Dave uh, Spinoza was the guy who he would write charts for us okay. in the band. I didn't know anything about it. And he would write these charts right. and I'd have to learn. So I learned how to read from his charts in rehearsals for the band I was in for a few months. And then in recording studios, when they, I'd be afraid to take a session that had a chart and right. Dave said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll help you. I'll help you because we did a lot of sessions together in New York, and I learned how to read. Um, what what reading I did, I learned in recording studios. Wow, so you were just really <laughs> thrown into the fire. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. I, one early on, when I was playing early on in my career, I got called to do this album by a guy named. At that time, his name was Hugo Montenegro. He was a famous composer. Um, <laughs> Really great guy, and he was an or or orchestra composer, and he composed for movies, films, and he did this album, and he did this album called Mammy Blue, and it was, I was booked for one day at RCA Studios, three sessions, three in the morning, three hours in the morning, three in the afternoon, three in the evening, you know, we did three, the whole album. Right. And when I walked in, there were at least 80-piece orchestra there. And I was so intimidated. And and um, he had been working in L.A. He had been working in L.A. And he had been working with a, one of my idols was uh, Jim Gordon. And um, and uh, so when he came to New York, they hired me, and I was in this all you know these, all these great studio musicians in New York um, rhythm section. But we were in the rhythm section was behind Gobos, and RCA was a big studio, big. And there's 80 pieces, strings, horns, the whole thing, everything written. And I had charts. Um, I had charts taped to all the stands around me. Uh, and, I'm yeah. and I'm looking at these charts, and all I see is spots on paper. I have no oh, no. <laughs> so the beginning of one of the very first songs we had to do, I look at it, and one of the first things you ever learn when you're reading music, other than quarter notes, is the dotted quarter, you know, dotted quarter note, quarter note figure, dotted quarter, quarter note, dotted quarter note, eighth note tied to a quarter, whatever it is. Right. It's a Charleston. I remember that when Dave taught me how to, you know, the first thing I learned was bop, bop. And he goes, it's a Charleston. Dun, dun. Da, da. Okay, so I get down. The first thing I see is the intro to this big song, and it's dotted quarter notes. And I'm looking at it, and it's like a cartoon where you look at the notes, and all of them go like this. Great. Standing behind the gobo. Yeah. And, and, and he's about to count it off. And I go, Dave, because when I say gobos, you know, we weren't in booths at that time. They were in this big right. room. Yeah, explain to the people what a gobo is. They they don't gobos, know. I don't know that you guys use them. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. So gobos are these these soundproof baffle things. It looks like it almost what's behind you on your couch. They right. look like that, and they could be any height. 
And they were, for me, at this session, I remember they were like eyeline when I was sitting down. And the guitar players, there were two or three guitar players, they were sitting down, keyboard player. You could see everybody's head above the gobos. Right, 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 right. So I lean over, and Dave was right over next to me. And I go, Dave, Dave. I'm freaking out. <laughs> What's this figure? Yeah. And he stands up and looks over, reach, looks over to me. The whole rhythm section is looking at because we're by ourselves. Right. And then you got 80 crazy old violin players who just don't care about anything. Right. <laughs> they they can read fly shit. They don't care. They don't pay attention. They they just do it perfectly every time. Yeah. He looks over at the chart and he goes, oh, Rick, that's my only hang-up. I don't know how to play that figure. And he sits back down and they all start laughing. Hugo Montenegro counts it off and there's the biggest train wreck happened yeah. in the first eight bars of this song. <laughs> he stops. And I'll never forget it. You know, you look over and here's my first time in a room with all these you know, because a lot of times back then we did these sessions and then they overdubbed the, the orchestra. This was the whole album was straight to tape. Wow. And we look over and I look over and the, the concert master, these old guys, you know, some of them were smoking pipes and stuff, looking at me like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so Montenegro calls me up. He yeah. Calls, oh, we, no. get, we get through that. And at the end, we get through that. And we're not, we're taking a break. And he, yeah. he goes, he goes, Rick, no. Nah, Come on up here. And I go up, he's at you know at the podium. And he goes, I think you might be a little nervous, aren't you? And I <laughs> he said, Look, um, he had a smile on his face. He says, Look, you, you sound great. It's great. Don't let those notes on the page scare you. Yeah. When I was in LA and I had to do this thing, they wanted me to do it in New York, I didn't know who to call. So I called the guy I use in L.A. all the time, Jim Gordon. And wow. Jim Gordon said, you have to call Rick Morata. So, you know, so, so if Jim Gordon tells me that you're good, yeah, you're really good. That's you know, awesome. And, and it totally turned everything around. And he said, by the way, he said, you sound great. Just if you have a problem with a figure, just ask me and we'll do it. And then the rest of it was sort of like. Wow, that could have yeah. gone a whole different way. Oh, huh? yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. One of the other ways it could have gone is after the break, I could have come back wearing a diaper. <laughs> <laughs> it was that scary. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. then, you know, a, lot of times, a lot of times I worked coming up, I, I started working. Steve Gadd and I became really, really, really close friends. And, and, and we used to work together a lot, a lot. And a lot of times there were charts. And the difference between me and Steve is Steve doesn't look at the chart until you count it off. I'm looking at the chart, you know, I'm like, okay, okay, this figure, that, 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 and, you know, and then they count it off and he would just piss me off because he'd look, start it, and then he would just, because, oh, it's two, we used to play a lot of two drummers. And he'd just look, at, he'd look at me, he knew, he'd just glance at it, he'd, he'd picture what the figure was and he'd look at me and play the figure right and I'm staring at the page, looking at him, and then I would screw it up because I'm looking over at him, and I don't remember what I'm playing. But, <laughs> but I mean, that's how my career started. I started in, uh, I learned how to read in recording studios. I've forgotten now how to read in recording studios. <laughs> we don't do it anymore. Right. Yeah. Hey, we got a couple of questions from uh, the audience, Rick. Uh, this was, this was. Uh, there were people ago. listening into this? Yeah, this is, hey, uh, <laughs> this is about your parents. Did your parents ever think you would make money from doing drum? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Quick, quick. No. Answer. I like hey, that. Hey, Rick, do you think, do you think that the, the dancing background added a sense of time for you? And, and you Yeah. Know? Exactly. I mean, you have to have natural talent, yeah, I would think, but for you to learn at, on the spot like starting that. starting at 19, I mean, that's late for... Yeah, yeah. yeah. The dance, the whole dance thing was, I think, was really um, instrumental in everything. And the reason that Spinoza said to me, you should play drums, um, do you should do rhythm and percussion and play drums. And, and yes, my father was really, really a well-known uh, rhythm dancer. He was... Um, he was famous for the mambo. They sent him down to, actually, we ended up moving to, when I was born, 
Uh, my parents, my sister was born in, in Miami because they sent my dad down to Miami to teach all these teachers the mambo. He was like the mambo king. So rhythm was in our blood. Yeah, there was a movie about that, wasn't yeah. there? <laughs> and, and rhythm was in our blood, you know. So I, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, but my my whole family I don't really know this, Rick. But drums are really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the thing one of the things about drums that is really difficult is you you to be a really good drummer of your ilk. You each appendage, each arm and leg has to work independently of each other to a certain degree. I mean, that's really difficult to learn. Yeah. Well, the trick is to not try to make them actually work uh, independently. You just let them go. Right, if yeah. Lucky, if you're lucky, they all drop in this right place. <laughs> oh, really? Is it luck? It's mostly <laughs> luck, is it? Oh, okay. For me, it's pure luck. You know, it's like, uh, uh, I remember, I know, you know, not to bring up Jim Gordon so much, but I remember once... I, I saw Jim Gordon when I met him the first time. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's he was really good, and he had a lot of um, light, a lot of mental issues, really bad mental issues. And and uh, and so, but I remember once I said to him, "Man, Jim, I came out. I was doing a session. I'm come flown into into L.A. from New York, and I, I was at A and M, and I came out." And Gordon was standing. I was taking a break from one of the takes. And Gordon was standing outside the Studio B at A uh, and M, and he was standing against the wall, and he was listening. And 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 he said to me, and I was shocked. And you know, I saw him. Then I go, "Hey, Jim, how you doing, blah blah?" And he goes, "Hey, man, it's good to see you. And um, you sound really great, really great." And I said, "Oh, I said that uh, you're an inspiration." I said, "You play the way you play. It's so great." And he said, "Ah." Eh, I just dropped the sticks. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, that's and it, it, to me, that's the way I play. I dropped yeah. the sticks. I know other guys like I, I with COVID, with all this last year. Um, Dad was getting on my case. I was talking to him on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and he said, "Have you been practicing?" And I said, "Actually, I haven't," because he's been practicing a lot. I said. Steve Gadd still practices. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> he's he's always been an inspiration and still is. He's unbelievable. And he, yeah, but he's been practicing a lot of rudiments, you know. Yeah, yeah. And those are fun. Those are fun to practice. Sure. They're fun. They're fun if you're good at rudiments. See, I'm not so good at rudiments because I didn't learn that way. I yeah, learned. Yeah, yeah. I brought a set of drums into my friend's house to, from my friend to my house, my parents' house. And I started banging, listening to records and playing to them, you know. And then I'd ask Andy Newmark if he could, if there was anything that he could give me, tell me how to do, and he, he would tell me. But um, sure. uh, back to this, when someone asked me if, my, someone said, did did uh, mm -hmm. I my parents think I was going to make money? Not only did they, I left college to play. I was in my second or third year of college, and I left to play drum, left to be in a band making literally no money. And yeah, my, they love my, parents, my parents threw me out. My dad threw me out in the street. And I did, they didn't talk to me for a year or two. I was living, Andy Newmark and I were living in a hotel in the suburbs of New York, uh, in Larchmont, New York, at a hotel called the Bevan Hotel, which was uh, old. It's not there anymore, but it was an incredibly beautiful place. It was in a beautiful place. They had this old, old, old hotel. It was just $35 a week was our rent. Was your, was your wow. rent, yeah. Wow. wow. 35 a week. And I remember some weeks. Just did, they, did they rent by the hour, too? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly... Right. It only on the weekends. <laughs> you want to know the truth? In retrospect, there was an old woman who ran that hotel. It was her hotel, yeah. and she ran it by herself. And she liked Andy and I a lot. I think yeah. she really liked us. Yeah. But the funny thing about it was when I was – so I'm nine, I'm 20 years old at the most, right? I was 19. I started playing drums. I started playing in bands right away. I left school right away. I got thrown out right away. Yeah. My, it's a big year. That, big that, year for Rick Morata. That happened to me, that happened to me <laughs> once too. I, I, I think it's happened to just about everybody. Yeah. But, this hotel, I just have to tell you this story. Before Andy and I had phones 
installed in our rooms because no one had phones there. You, you, there was a, she was at the desk and she ran the phone. And when she ran the phones, it was one of those things where she had a thing on her, you know, she had a yeah. thing in her head and the phone would ring. She'd answer it. Hello, Bevan Hotel. Uh, and there was nobody there. The guys that lived there didn't have anybody calling them or any money. There were mostly guys that were sort of indigent and, and there was a lot of this going on. And guys, I remember one night, I, I tried, one night I, I heard something outside my door. I went to open the door and there was a guy passed out at my door. I couldn't even get out. I had to go through Andy's. I had an adjoining room with Andy. I had to go out his house and find out what was going on. Anyway, she would answer the phone and then she would go, okay. And she would hook the, you know, those lines like you're in a recording, like a patch bay. Yeah. yeah a patch bay. She'd hook it up like this. And in the hallway, the phone would ring and someone would, was like living in a dorm, right? Yeah. But we knew when the phone rang for the first month we were there, we didn't have phones because we couldn't afford it. We knew that it was for us because no one else got a call. You walk out in the hall and the phone was a box on the wall and you would lift the receiver up, put it to your ear and talk into this little right. megaphone that was right. in the box. Say hello, mama. <laughs> <laughs> and what we found out was the woman downstairs, when we got the call, she would never get off the phone. Yeah, she'd listen she in. Was listening she, to listened, she listened to everything because she wanted to make sure nothing bad was going on. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's her hotel. I got to make sure everything's good. Hey, we got another question for you, Rick, from the – did you ever work with or mingle with the late Neil Pert? No, I did not. Yeah. No, but 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 a, a guy I played golf with out here uh, was his next-door neighbor and said he oh, was yeah. a very nice guy. But, no – I was never, for some reason, our paths never really crossed. I don't know why. I didn't play in a lot of um, Rush kind of bands. Yeah. Right, right. I always he, thought they were really good. At his band, and that's pretty much where he stayed, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 And there was yeah. Arena Rock, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was Canadian, so. Yeah. So, Rick, <laughs> no, but there's no reason. There's, you know, he lived out here. He lived out here, and, and there was no reason for us not to. But for some reason, he's just one of those guys – who we never really crossed paths. I was really sorry to hear about his passing. Yeah, I, I got a question. Uh, I'm going to jump a little bit. Uh, you played on Pay, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about that session? Did you know that that song was going to be such a classic when you were playing <clears throat> on it? Because it's just so different. You know? That whole record. Yeah. Well, well Hampton, Pig, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. I, I have to say, when I, when I talk about Steely Dan, everybody asks me about Steely Dan everywhere. You know, it's always – Steely Dan, uh, what was Steely Dan like? I've done a lot, a lot of records and a lot of great, a lot of great records. And with Steely Dan, I love those guys. When they first called Why? me, <laughs> when they first called me, I actually turned it down because I was so busy in New York. And then Elliot Shiner called me and said, I'll never forget it. He goes, what is wrong with you? Uh, what kind of an idiot are you? Yeah. I just talked to Donald and Walter. And they, I didn't know who Steely Dan was. It was way, way, way back. And, I, you know, I was doing all these big records. And I'm, it didn't matter to me. I was tired. I'm lazy. I already told you that. Yeah. So, anyway, he said, "You're." I, I told them, forget it. He'll be here. Don't worry about it. And I showed up. And um, I didn't know what to expect. And I remember Donald coming up to me when we first met and saying, oh, he had heard my stuff. And he was telling me that he was – Really glad I was there and I, that I considered it. Yeah, yeah, kid, sure, fine. Everything's going to be good. And then he started singing this. Um, the first song I ever did with them, I think Larry Carlton was there in the room, and I had never played with Larry before. And uh, might have been Chuck Rainey. And it, the song was Don't Take Me Alive. And the very first things out of Donald's mouth, when we played it, he sang. He played and sang. I was hooked. Yeah. So in answer yeah. to did I know it was a great – I didn't know. But I did know that every time I walked in the studio with them, something great was going to come out of it. Right. Hey, Rick, didn't you tell me <laughs> once that you, didn't, you never really knew when you were doing records with them if you were actually going to end up on the final record? Right. Because yeah. they kept put bringing they, – they, it's a revolving door. Yeah. They, there's a DVD. There's a <clears throat> DVD out. Called the and it's I think it's on YouTube as well. And there's a video out called "The Making of Asia." Yep. 
And in the making of Asia, I talk about that. I talk about how after we did Asia, I had done Royal Scam and then Asia. Uh, I had worked on Royal Scam, worked on, on, on the Asia album. And you have no idea how many more songs that they have in the can that right. no one has heard because we just did song after song after song and they, they had so much to choose from. Yeah. But then when they called Donald, I became really friendly with them and Donald wanted to do work on the Gaucho album. And I said, no. And he's what? Why? I said, every time I do these, I said, we end up working on it. It takes forever. And then I'll work on one song for a whole day. And then next day, there's a whole other band. There's not another drummer. There's a whole other band there. Yeah. Wow. And he goes, what do you want to do? He goes, how about we do this? I said, let's go, me and you. We'll go in the studio and we'll work on some tracks. Okay. So just Donald and I. And Walter went in. Gary Katz engineering. I'm Gary Katz producing, and Donald and Walter and I, and we ended up cranking out "Hey 19 and "Time Out of Mind." Like wow! That. So, so did they just play all, everything, or they, did you bring just guys? Donald. Just Donald. Wow! Wow! Donald sang, but you don't need a whole lot more than that. And then I think we did it later again. Yeah. yeah. I think I, you don't need a lot more than. Then, then Donald, I was thinking about it the other day, the way he writes, the way those guys both, not only Donald, uh, Walter, I didn't realize how, because when we did it, Walter was, he didn't play, he didn't play bass on the stuff that we did. It was generally, it was Chuck Rainey. And Chuck and I had been on the road together and done so many records together that we had a short end. We could look at each other. Like that's how Peg came about. You right. know, they told him not to do something. They, they just put the charts up in front of us, and, and I'm not reading. I'm just looking at the roadmap, and right. they, they start to the groove. And when as soon as you hear Donald playing and start singing, and Chuck and I started playing, Chuck and I have been on the road with Roberta Flack. We have been done so many records, but we had spent a couple of years on the road with Roberta playing yeah. Yeah. a few minutes, four or five nights a week. Right. We had a shorthand. We knew how we, you know, we knew we had a pocket together, and I knew – if I did something that went like this, yeah, he would go like this, right? And, yeah. he, and he knew that if he did something that went like this, yeah, I would go like this. We just had that shorthand, right? And you know, it was funny. I was thinking about this the other day. The way we talk about doing records now, you guys will cut some tracks. I have my studio here. You'll send me the track. I'll go down and I'll play, right? I'll yeah. send it back to you. I mean, you'll say, "Well, can you try it one more time?" I'll send it to you again, and then. Then I'll change my telephone number so that you can't reach me. Yeah. Or, 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 yeah, or right. Or, or, or we'll say, hey, <laughs> hey, can you give me Steve Gadd's number? Yeah, that's the <laughs> other thing that happens. All the, sometimes I, when people call me to do it, I just give them Steve's number. <laughs> right. Eventually, you're going to go there. And maybe there anyway, so you may as well. So, <laughs> right. well. Yeah, cut the middleman out. <laughs> so what I was thinking about the other day was the fact that, and I was thinking about Peg, actually. I was thinking about all these records that, I did that were virtually live records. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're live albums. We were playing. There was just, we were playing. Right. Yeah. We run the song down a couple of times and we get it. Now with Steely Dan, they would, we would do take after take, but I'm telling you in the end, when you listen to some of the things that forget stuff that I did with them, when I listen to things like Babylon Sister, yeah. Babylon Sisters, or I listen to on the Royal Scam album, all the stuff that Bernard Purdy played on Haitian Divorce and all of those insane, God almighty, they were unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable songs and, 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 and bands. And, and, you know, it was fun to do. Well, Rick, who are some, I mean, you played with so many people. There's something like Plastic Ono Band. You you played in. I got a couple uh, I want to hear uh, about. James Taylor, uh, Carly Simon, like all those people. Like who Cartney, are some? Uh, Aretha Franklin. <laughs> you've told me some great stories about Aretha Franklin. Uh, what are some other notable people you could tell us? Some some. Uh, I always liked playing with really good songwriters. So somebody who I didn't get to work with all the time, but when I did work with them, I really liked it. Was 
Jackson Brown. And it was really hard because Jackson was one, Jackson's one of my favorite songwriters, really. Yeah. All time. Yeah. And too. I, was lucky. I mean, I played with James Taylor at the peak of his career. I played with Jackson at the peak. Um, I played with um, Carol King. And they're singer songwriters. So I did some records. It's funny. Somebody's with the, with social media now. People people will will um, post stuff that I forgot about. For yeah. example, yeah. somebody posted a Tom Scott song last week somewhere that I remembered having played with Anthony Jackson, played bass on it, who is, there aren't even words to express how good that guy is. Um, but it ended up being the theme song. They recut it with Harvey Mason, but I did the original part and it was a drum part, but I just came up with a studio. It was great. It, the song, the, the piece of music was great. And it became the theme song for Starsky and Hutch. Oh, uh, huh. And I didn't, re you know, I, I remembered that when it happened, it was for Tom Scott on Tom Scott's record. And then there was the, another instrumental album I did because the, Tom produced it. Um, I don't know if you know Tom Scott is, but he's a sax player. He's brilliant. Mm -hmm. you, you would know him if you went back and listened to old Joni oh, sure. Records. And, uh, you know, he produced Doc Severinsen, who was still on The Tonight Show. Okay? Oh, cool. Wow. And we did an instrumental album. Doc Severinsen, funky album. And it was those guys. I think it was Chuck Rainey, me, Richard T., Ralph McDonald. Um, some of this stuff was just unbelievable. And, and, and uh, oh, no, it wasn't Chuck. It was, I believe it was Anthony Jackson. Mm -hmm. And some of this stuff was just scary good. And those are the obscure things. But I, I liked working with, like, a lot of the stuff I did with James Taylor, for example. I did this one song with James that, People have been – Carlos Guzman actually pulled it out of someplace and he posted it and a bunch of people heard it for the first time on an album of James's that didn't do that well called Dad Loves His Work, but the song was called uh, Hour That the Morning Comes. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. I, and I love that record. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I used to come to Nashville a lot. Like there was a, there was a period of two or three years when I was coming down there six to eight times a year from L.A. or New York to do albums. And I worked with Jesse Coulter, um, oh, wow. Waylon Jennings. Um, oh, shit. I can't, I wish I could Dolly Parton was one. You did some stuff with Dolly? I did Dolly, but we did Dolly in LA. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you remember where you recorded when you came to Nashville? Where was the studio that had no control room? Hmm. Sound no control room. No. Oh, uh, well, I mean, there's a uh, the RCA place uh, has a control room, but it's 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 got you know it's one big room, and the control room is like in a loft. No, no, yeah. I wish I could remember the name of the place. I'll have to look on the album. No control room. How? I mean, yeah. how's that even possible? <laughs> Everybody had headphones on, even if they were in the control room. I'm trying to remember. Jimmy Bowen was the producer, and Tony Brown was a producer back then. So oh. it was where it was where Bowen did all of his records. Um, oh gosh, he did a lot in, on on Soundstage, I think, didn't he? Um, I was going to say Soundstage. Uh, uh, I think yeah. Emerald. I think he did some stuff at Emerald. Uh, Soundstage. It might have been Soundstage. That yeah. Well, that must have been really old Soundstage yeah. because they've all got control rooms now. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe it did have a control room, but we never. They didn't. I'm trying to remember. Everything was on headphones. Yeah. 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 Huh. Hey, but we're we going to need to get Rick. We got to wrap it up. We can keep going for a little bit. If unless you've got to go, Rick, you got a couple more minutes. Yeah, I got a couple more minutes. Hey, Rick, I want to ask you too, just because um, you know I, I was lucky enough to work with Rick on, <clears throat> on in TV, and I and I want to hear how you got started doing everybody loves Raymond and all those shows, like how you got into doing television. As well, a like I said earlier, so I was doing a, when you, there was a period where I was just working all the time in the studio. If I wasn't in the studio or if I wasn't on the road, I was in a recording studio and I, I get it. There are people that love that. And not all of the gigs I did were, a lot of fun, <laughs> but some were, you know, there were some great gigs, 
But yeah. so you're in a recording studio, you're in, you're on the road, and I got tired. Yeah. They were really tired. So I was spending a lot of time in Los Angeles because everything everything was everybody was working out of LA at the time. They brought Don Grolnick and I from New York into LA to work on all these uh, California mafia stuff like Ron Stanton, and James Taylor and um and uh uh <clears throat> Jackson and Warren Zevon, one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. One of the best things I ever did was with Warren. Um, so I got tired. That's the point. And I took I, a couple of times in my career, I took long, long time off, hiding out from people. First time I came to LA, not the first time, but one of the times I came to LA, I literally was living in my apartment in New York and had a house there too. And I rented a room in a friend of mine's house in LA and just hid out forever. And then Allie Willis tracked me down and had me, I wrote with her for almost a year. And then Larry Carlton tracked me down and, and I was running out of money. And Larry said, he found me and he said, <laughs> time to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Larry. <laughs> But so the, the so this was going on, and, and it was my love hate relationship with the road because when I went to work with Larry, we'd do an album, and then we went out on the road. And so at that time, I did have to make money. So I went out with Larry, and I went out with Stevie Nicks one year. Was I would do like five weeks on with Stevie, and then we'd have two weeks off, and Larry would book those two weeks, and we would oh go like, Oh my God. So I remember a time I went, I was with, I was with um, Stevie touring Australia for like five weeks, six weeks. I landed in LA, threw stuff out of my um, suitcase, threw another suitcase together and left the next day for Brazil for two weeks mm. for, re for South America with Larry. Mm. And it was just, and it was great. The great part was you go from playing Stevie's music, which I loved, to playing Larry's music, which I loved, which were totally different. And at one time, they were Larry was in New York and Stevie was in New York at the same time. We were playing New Jersey Homedale uh, Arena, uh, the Homedale Outdoor uh, Shed in in uh, Garden City and in, in in Garden State Arena or whatever it was in in uh, Jersey. And they were playing the Bottom Line in Larry was playing the Bottom Line. I did the gig out in um, in, in Jersey. My tech threw had a car waiting. They had drums set up for me at, at the other place. I jump in my car. We, we we jump in the rental car. We drive into New York and did that night. Oh bottom line, and the guys from and and the uh, some of the crew and band from Stevie's band jumped in the car. They came to the gig afterwards. Of course, I was a mess, and yeah. they were like, <clears throat> they were like, how did you do? It's so different. The music was. I mean, it couldn't have been more night and day. That's what I loved. Yeah, I was right. so tired. I was so tired that mm. I, I was playing golf with a buddy of mine named Alan Kirschenbaum, who's no longer with us yeah. years ago. And I, <laughs> I had been <clears throat> playing live on the Tracy Ullman show, and I met Sam McMurray. Sam introduced me to Alan Kirschenbaum on a golf course. And Sam said, you know, Rick's playing. He's the musical director on the Tracy show this year, and he's also playing drums on the show. Alan was a TV producer. Alan said to me, I'm going to be doing a show in – about nine months, he knew who I was because he was an audiophile. He said, what do you think about maybe doing the music to my show? I said, great, sure. And then we, we walked to our cars together. We left and that was it. I gave him my number. I heard from him about six months later. He never forgot. He called me. Wow. And I had put together a reel like we do, Brett, you know those reels and stuff? Yeah. So I had a cassette. At the time, it was a cassette. And I'll never forget it. I, he asked me to meet with him. He was doing a television show called Down the Shore. He had already had a theme for it, but he needed a composer. I had, you know, it was probably my first job. And I had all these, but I had done a couple, a few other things. And I had on this reel on a, on a, on a cassette. I go and meet with him. We sit down, meet in his office. Meeting went really well. And he said, you know what? You're hired. And I said, you know, I don't feel good about that. I'll tell you what, here's my reel. And I put the reel. <laughs> you I turned down more gigs. <laughs> I put the reel on the desk, on his desk. So I'm, he's sitting where, like you are. I'm sitting where I am here. And I, I put the reel down and I slid it across the room. Here's my reel. Why don't you listen to it? If you like what you hear, give me a call. I'd be happy to do the show. He took his fingers. He put it on the reel, on the cassette. And he went, you could only lose the gig. 
<laughs> That's what here. a great yeah. response. Great. Hey, for the listeners, explain to them what a cassette is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Man, uh, Rick, it's been a, a pleasure, a real pleasure talking to you. I really do want to have you back. Well, because yeah. I've got a ton, a ton of questions. I got to ask one more, one more thing though about. So, how did you get Raymond from that? Well, so Alan Kirschenbaum's partner was a guy named Phil Rosenthal. Yeah. So they were partners. They did that show together and they we we got on really, really well. When that show was over after two years, it got canceled. They went to do this other show called Coach, which had a had a composer on it, but they there was this hour special that they did. They called me to do the hour special, which I did. And when that was over, Phil Rosenthal got this obscure show called Everybody Loves Raymond. And 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 um, and Alan, his partner, went off and did another show that he did, and I so I ended up doing both of them. Um, I didn't even do the pilot for Everybody Loves Raymond, but after the pilot got picked up, Phil called me because we had a relationship. He called me and he said, "You want to do the show?" And I said, "Of course," you know. And it was it was a, such a long shot. It was I remember that year. I think there were six or seven comedies that were picked up for television that year. And every other one of them had big stars in it, like uh, Ted Danson or Rhea Perlman or uh, Lucy Liu and all these big stars. And we had Everybody Loves Raymond that had this completely unknown guy named Ray Romano and, um, and, uh, and nobody else. But they had Doris and they had uh, Doris Roberts and, and uh, Peter Boyle. Right. And, all the other shows that year got canceled. But for some reason, they kept that one show, which wasn't going through the roof. It was on a Friday night or something. Yeah. And they picked it up, and they moved it the following year to, like, Monday. And that was history, man. It, was, it took off. So it was really lucky, a very yeah. lucky thing. But yeah. I think, as you guys know, if anybody out there that's – Yeah, Ray Romano is amazing. Oh, he's great. I, and, and we're still very, very good friends. As a matter of fact, he's in New York right now. Um, he's the reason I got back to L.A. He, he brought me back to L.A. from, from New York. But um, he's in New York right now directing his first feature. Who, Ray? Yeah. That's oh, cool. nice. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, his dramatic work is I've really been impressed mm -hmm. with. Oh, yeah, man. I really – He's great all the way around. I've seen him grow as an actor, and I'm very lucky. We've stayed pretty good friends. I mean, we, I play golf with him a lot. I like to play golf a lot. He plays golf. So last week, he left last week, and he called me. We played twice last week before he left. And he said, do you want to go to New York? If you want to ride to New York, come on, hop on the plane. It's me and the, the kids and his wife. And I and I no normally would have done it, except I'm not, I'm not in a rush to move around anywhere right now. Right, you know, right, yeah. right. Yeah. We got three months. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rick, I want to ask you one more thing too. Uh, I just want to ask you about John Lennon, just like you know, playing in the Plastic Ono band, and that was like '73, right? Yeah, Lennon and McCartney. We got to get those in. I mean, God. yeah. Well, that's why we got to have them back. <laughs> yeah. I know. So I got a ton. I mean, I got like I haven't even like scratched, scratched the surface <laughs> yet. <laughs> we'll do it again. But yeah, John Lennon was. Uh, I mean. And Newmark, Newmark worked with him a lot, but and I worked in the Plastic Ono band with um, Steve and I played together in that band. But with John, you know, I he was what a waste. He was such a nice guy, mm -hmm. totally down to earth. But he was John Lennon, you know. So we would go because we were we were hang, we were working with Yoko and with John at the same time. We would all hang out together a lot, and um, we'd go hang out at dinner. And he was just so down to earth and so normal. And the hardest thing would be when you go to dinner with him. It would be like he he was oh, it was just inundated with people. It's just you know, just <clears throat> yeah yeah that'd be tough yeah but but he was good. You know he knew how to. He knew how to like sort of be nice to everybody and yet not let it overtake. Like he could, he would say, "Listen, I'm I'm, I'm happy to see you and talk to you, but I'm really having dinner now with some friends. Is it okay if we pick this up later?" And people were generally respectful of it. 
Yeah, yeah. He had a lot of practice with dealing with his fans, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 What, what were the tracks he played on of his? Oh God. I know that on one album on the on the album, see I don't remember a lot of this stuff, but I know I played on Meat City. Me and it was me and um uh uh Jim Keltner and two drummers and uh, there was another ballad on that album i don't remember the names yeah we don't do two drummers anymore it surprises me that you've actually worked with other drummers that, that surprises me because well right now my brother jerry and i have a band together on martha's vineyard called the marotta brothers and it's really great yeah and your brother played with peter played with peter gabriel yeah he did and a lot of other that's people. One of Troy, that's, that's one of, one of people, Troy's right? favorites, Peter Gabriel. Oh, yeah. yeah one of my yeah. favorites as well. For yeah. sure. Hey, Rick, have you ever thought about doing Ringo's All-Star? Uh, well, if he would have ever asked me to do it, I would have thought about that. <laughs> yeah, that's right there. <laughs> but that, that would be great, though. He doesn't, he doesn't need me. He's got Greg Bisson. He called me either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the hard part about this business. If people don't call you, you actually don't have a job. I've never, <laughs> I've never picked up the phone to get a job. I was very lucky, not good. But the way the business is now, it's totally different. But Ringo, uh, Greg Bissonette is so good in that band. I mean, he's he's so perfect. And <clears throat> he's such a egoless person. And that's they. I think they get along really well. I, I don't know if Ringo's son plays with him, too. I, I don't know. How many? I don't know how many people. Um, I don't know how many people there are in that band anymore? You know, look. The one downside is if you're ever going to be in a band with Joe Walsh, you got to be prepared for anything. All hell to break loose. Because of course, yeah, that's one of my favorites. I'm a huge Eagles fan. So, yeah, Brown, a little bit of Joe, and now Joe Walsh. Yeah, JD Souther. Oh yeah, I mean JD. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did. We did JD. He was another great album that we did back then, and JD was great. And we did some gigs with JD, and and uh, yeah, um, Walsh is an unbelievable guitar player. Yeah, you know yeah. who works with Joe is Joe's got. Um, I did it, the Confessor with Joe. I did that album, and a lot of that album was um, a lot of his songs are confessions, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was uh it was um uh jeff carl and i played on that record and uh, uh the confessor yeah it was it was a good album except i realized when we did it when we finished it um it was there's there was a lot there was a lot of bottom end missing on the record mm. and i think it was because our ears were clogged <laughs> we, got, happen. we got a lot to talk about in another interview. Man. Yeah, we, can we, can we have you on. back? Yeah, sure. Love to have you back, man. We get, I mean, we've got another hour at least to talk to you about stuff. Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, anytime. I'm, I'm, I'm fine oh, yeah, with that yeah, yeah. too. Yeah, Rick, yeah. thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. You're, you're My pleasure. A anytime, Brett. It's great to see you. Great to see all you guys. But I yeah, haven't gotten to see Brett in a long time. We yeah. we were mates out here when he was in the studio right next to mine. Absolutely. Building. Yeah, I really good to see you. And thanks for doing this, Rick. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you're all vaccined, yeah. vaccined up. And, uh, and yeah. we'll stay healthy. Everybody stay healthy. Yeah. yeah. You too, man. Well, guys, stay thanks good. for joining us for the Nashvillains Live uh, Beer Rick 30 Rick. with our beer buddy, Rick Marotti. You guys have a good one. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Bye, Rick. Bye, guys. See you, bye.